So this little presentation is going to be about some of the work Nicholas of Nicholas Hawksmoor, who was an architect and Christopher Wren's only pupil. Most people of our sort of age, I think, came across Hawksmoor if they came across him at all through fiction. Really famously, his church is featured in From Hell by Alan Moore, which is a, an amazing graphic novel about the Jack the Ripper murders. And in that, the Hawksmoor's churches feature as some kind of, in some kind of ritual, sort of Masonic ritual murder. And the churches, especially Christchurch Spitalfields, uh, features very heavily in From Hell. To the left is the cover, or the early cover of the novel Hawksmoor by Peter Ackroyd. That red church there is um, Christchurch Spitalfields, and um, it doesn't have a massive skull on it. The idea of, of, uh, for, for Peter Ackroyd's novel um, came from stealing the idea from the poem Lud's Heat by Ian Sinclair. Now, I'll explain what this idea is. In Lud's Heat, Ian Sinclair points out that if you map uh, Hawksmoor's churches, they make a pattern, and he called this pattern the shape of fear. And Lud's Heat is a very convoluted and involved poem about psychogeography which is a you know a poet's way of describing going for a wander and getting a bit lost and seeing what you find in Lud's heat um ian sinclair points out this this pattern and basically peter ackroy stole that idea and in his book hawksmoor <clears throat> the architect goes around and as he's building his churches he performs satanic rituals in the basement specifically in the basement of this church Christchurch Spitalfields, Peter Ackroyd says Hawksmoor built a labyrinth. Well, that's part of the fiction. And that labyrinth was there to perform uh, for, for the purpose of satanic ritual. So anyway, you can see Hawksmoor's appear. This is very much how I came across him. First of all, when I was younger, reading From Hell, and just sort of knowing about him, and then coming across Hawksmoor, the novel, and learning about Lutite. <clears throat> so lots of people, talk, interesting people talk about him. There's a sort of a mystique about that, uh, that surrounds Hawksmoor, which intrigued me and I looked more into it. Now, this is Christ Church Spitalfields. It is a very, very strange church. I live just down the road from it in Whitechapel and I've never seen a building like it. It is very, 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 I'm gonna say eccentric, massive, absolutely massive in scale. Now, the, the picture in the middle there what I tr was trying to show was these cubes at the bottom of these columns. There's absolutely no reason for them. They're not decorative. They're not anything else other than massive lumps of stone, which kind of make the point that this church is absolutely enormous in scale, that the, the, the size of the masonry, all of it's built with massively thick walls, with massively thick columns. It's a very sturdy looking thing. And that's because part of, Hawksmoor's brief when he was building these churches was to make them look solemn and awful within and without. Essentially to make them look scary and imposing. And it is a very, very imposing building. If you stand underneath it, it looks like the, um, the tower is kind of leaning over you. And that's a deliberate effect that he put, um, created, again, to make the, the building look very, very, very imposing, which it does. Um, inside, it's very ornate as are most of his churches. Um, I think they're sort of making a, a sort of Protestant uh, comparison with like an austere exterior with a more decorative interior, like your, your spiritual life is meant to be or something like that. The point being, well, the point I wanted to emphasize by just showing you this is these churches were built um, <clears throat> at the beginning of the 18th century as a, a result of what was called the 1711 50 Churches Act. The Tories wanted 50 churches like this built across London, specifically in the suburbs. And that was what the 50 Churches Act did. Now, only uh, about 12 churches were ever built under that act because it was a Tory bill. And once the Whigs got in, they stopped it. And actually, the whole time Hawksmoor was building his churches was actually under a Whig administration. And he was subject to a lot of scrutiny because people wanted to know what he was up to. Essentially, he was well known to be Christopher Wren's only apprentice. And essentially, he was carrying on work that Christopher Wren had never um, succeeded in completing. 
Um, <clears throat> so this is the shape of fear. I'm going to just move our pictures a little bit just so we can see the, all of them. This is Hawksmoor's churches mapped out on, 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 in London. Um, I'll go through them quickly. At the bottom right is what the first church he built, St Alphages in Greenwich. That was built under kind of mysterious circumstances. There was an old church there, and one day the, the wind came along, the story goes, and blew the roof off. So it all fell down, and people petitioned for a new church to be built. It's all a bit convenient. What happened was there was a tax on coal that had paid for the building of St Paul's Cathedral. St Paul's Cathedral just about being finished. And there was a lot of money in this tax in coal and it was keeping a lot of people employed. And lo and behold, just as the tax was being debated, an old prestigious church fell down and Parliament under the Tories was persuaded to take the coal tax and give it to the 50 Churches Act, to the building of 50 new churches. So St Alphages is, is the first one he built under very, very, very lucky circumstances for him. He next built um, the one in Limehouse, which is labelled number three, then the one labelled number five in Wapping. Now that church, actually, he wanted to build about 200 yards to the west, maybe a few millimetres to the left on this map. He was thwarted in doing this because people bought the land that he was trying to buy and wouldn't sell it to him. And he was quite angry about this. It took him quite a while. He tried very hard to get hold of a piece of land it would have made these four churches in the middle form a square. I think you can see number one, what well, label one, six, seven, and five, almost make a square. And um, the distances between them are very regular, except for this church in Wapping, where he didn't get to build where he wanted to. The church label number one is Christ Church Spitalfields that I showed you. Church number six is actually right in the heart of the city of London. It's called St Mary Woolnoths. And it's the parish church for the um, mayor of London and the governor of Bank of England. Bear in mind, the 50 Churches Act was to make churches in poor areas of London uh, to spread the good news of the Bible and all of that to all the, those poor people who didn't have to go to church on Sunday. The church in, built in the city of London is opulent. It is incredibly lovely, beautifully decorated, and it has nothing to do with anything to do with the 50, what the 50 Churches Act said it was about, which was giving churches to poor people. Somehow or another, the mayor of London ended up with a beautiful church right on his doorstep. Lastly is the church furthest to the west, that's St George's in Holborn. Yeah, that's famous for having a, a, no cross on it, not born, no real Christian imagery on it, but it does have a recreation of the step pyramid of Halicarnassus on top of a square tower. You've never seen a church like it. There's never been a church like it before or since. Some people said it's a result of him going a bit mad. It's very, very definitely a celebration of death because the mausoleum of Halicarnassus was the symbol of, of death and the triumph of, uh, the, the triumph of someone who's led a glorious life, you could say. You hopefully noticed number seven down there at the bottom. That wasn't actually built by Hawksmoor, but the land was purchased and it was built, the church there in Deptford was built by his apprentice, John James. So you can see between, he built six churches and this seventh one is uh, by his apprentice and he was very much involved in the organisation of um, organization of it all. So that's what Ian Sinclair called the shape of fear. That's the pattern that Hawksmoor's churches make. Ian Sinclair says something very much like what comes out in uh, Ackroyd's novel that Hawksmoor was some kind of Satanist and there was some kind of ritual significance to all this. Now, whether or not Hawksmoor was a Satanist, he was definitely a Freemason. And that's something much more tangible to me than a, a Satanist, because, you know, there are, there's a real thing called Freemasonry. You know, his, his master, I'm going to say, Christopher Wren, was pretty much the arch Freemason in London of a certain stripe. So it seems to me, rather than this being uh, of, or it seemed to me at the time, and I still think, rather than it being Satanic in inspiration, it's probably Masonic which would make sense because they were Masons and, you know, Masons build things. Um, that's, I'll just say, that's where I, that's where I started with this idea. Hang on, let me, uh, so that's roughly the shape of fear. Hawksmoor's church is laid out on a map. This was what Hawksmoor's master, Christopher Wren, 
nearly got done in 1666. Uh, this is Wren's plan that he had drawn up a few days after the Fire of London. Now, we talked about the Fire of London before, but it's, I think, worth pointing out that um, Wren had spent the previous year in Paris, learn, so that's the year 1665, learning how to do town planning from, from the chief architect of Louis XIV, a guy called Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Christopher Wren had been sent over to Paris by arrangement of the queen, the king's mother, Henrietta Maria, who was also um, Louis XIV's auntie. So it was a very cosy relationship between the Stuart royals and their inner circle, of which Wren was very much a part, and the French. So the whole time the plague was happening, Wren was in Paris learning how to draw street plans and how to plan a city. He came back and obviously there was the fire of London and very, very quickly he came up with this plan. This plan was to reimpose a sense of order on London that had never been there before. On September the 18th, 1666, Charles II declared in the aftermath of the fire, no one was to start rebuilding until they'd worked out how to put in a new street plan, i.e. to implement Wren's plan. And on the morning of September the 18th, 1666, Wren thought he got his way. He thought this plan was going to happen and he was very, very happy about it. Later that day, a delegation from the City of London turned up and said, if you impose this street plan, then you're a tyrant. This fire doesn't seem like an accident anyway. You're trying to impose this beautiful plan that seems very well <laughs> organized on our city is, is proof positive that you're a tyrant, that you burnt down the city on purpose and you want to impose this on this, you want to impose this plan on us. We're not having it. If you try and impose this, we will start another civil war. So Charles probably thought about it for all of 30 seconds and said, all right then. And the city of London went home and told everyone they could rebuild as they wanted to. And later in the day, Charles had a proclamation drawn up saying the exact opposite of what the proclamation in the morning had said, which was, you can rebuild London. We'll talk about some adjustments to maybe the customs house, but everyone's property rights are 100% intact and we won't be imposing this plan. That made Wren very, very, very angry, uh, to put it mildly. He, he wrote some unbelievable things about the king and uh, to the king, uh, you know, part of his biography. Um, he never forgave Charles II for what he called this betrayal. So this is 1666, and this is Hawksmoor's master. Now, Hawksmoor wasn't born until 1661. So he was only you know, five years old when this happened, but you'll see that didn't stop him even late, much later in life, being very, very angry about the Great Fire of London. So this is a quote from the 1720s. This is really the, the thing when I was first trying to find out more about Hawksmoor, having read the fiction, I read a, a book that contained some of his letters. And it was just odd to me. I had no context. I couldn't understand why anyone would be so angry about the Great Fire of London, especially when it had happened like 50 years before. Right? So he read... A so London should have been built a convenient and regular, well-beat city, excellent, skillful, honest artifices made by the greatness of the quantity of the work in rebuilding such a capital. But instead of this, we have no city, nor streets, nor houses, but a chaos of dirt and rotten shreds, always tumbling or taking fire with winding, crooked paths, to scarce practical legs. Of I mean, it's just, he's angry and he comes out in his sentence structure 50 years later. Um, and it really struck me as why would anyone be angry about the Great Fire of London, which was obviously just an accident because, you know, we've got told so at primary school. Also, why was Hawksmoor so controversial? Why did so many people go out their way to block his work and to frustrate him? So he was angry <laughs> about pretty much everything. I want to draw your attention to something that occurred to me much later, the, 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 the sort of implication behind this first sentence. So the city should be rebuilt. And Skillful, honest artificers, which is a very strange phrase, made by the greatness and quantity of the work. In other words, once the city had been burnt down, it would have to be rebuilt again, and you'd have to build, you'd have to train up loads and loads of people, skilled, honest artificers. Now, honest artificers seems to me to be one of those words that's a euphemism, and he probably means masons. So, in fact, when the whole of London was burnt down and rebuilt in stone, you're obviously going to need a lot of people who cut stone, masons. And so it seems to me the indication here is the fire was 
as well as leveling the place, it was going to be a great opportunity to recruit Masons. And obviously, you know, famously, it was just on outside the grounds of St Paul's Cathedral when it was being rebuilt that Freemasonry uh, got its beginning. I think it was on June 24th, 1717. And June 24th is a date we'll actually come back to in a little bit. But yeah, so this is Hawksmoor, 50 years after the fire, angry about the fire. Clearly, clearly now to me, it's just he's just taken on the prejudices and the so on, you know, taken on the attitudes of his master, who was an incredibly powerful and uh, talented architect. And this is just Hawksmoor echoing what Wren had been saying for all, the rest of his life. This is where I, I'm going to introduce sort of my hypothesis. I, I, like, like I said, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't square Hawksmoor being a Satanist with reality. I, 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 it just didn't seem like a real thing, but masonry is. So it, it just kind of occurred to me that there's a similarity there. I'm going to put it no further than that. And it, it, by offering it up in this way, I could have built up to this better or in a more persuasive way. So this looks slightly less ridiculous, but I want to just talk you through the, the thought process here, because to there's a lot of stuff said about the Eye of Horus and the story of Isis and Osiris. My own understanding of it comes from the work of a, a guy called Robert Graves, who was a poet. He wrote I, Claudius, and he, he makes a really, really powerful point about a lot of myths and legends, which is they, they essentially often just encode useful information in a kind of poetic way. So I'm going to talk you through roughly my understanding of Robert Graves' interpretation of the myth of Isis and Osiris. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? So the guy on the furthest left is Thoth. He's the god of letters and measurement, and he's the guy who kind of whispers in the king's ear. He's very much the vizier and the power behind the throne. Thoth, like I say, mathematics, language, measurement, um, these were his domain. He was very much the god of wisdom. Next is Osiris. Now, Osiris is the glorious king. He's like God in heaven. He's the triumphant king who's ascended to heaven and exists in forever in glory. He's kind of like the father in heaven. Next to him, with the eagle's face, is Horus. And now he's very much the, the living embodiment of all the, all the great powers of nature. He's the sort of symbol of, if you like, of the living Pharaoh, so he's sort of the son on earth to Osiris's father in heaven. Next, again, in sort of in the middle, the, the sort of donkey Anubis face, whatever that is, that ugly face, that's Seth. Um, Seth is the bad guy. Seth is Osiris's brother. Um, he's the evil uncle to Horus. He's the guy who, I'll tell you in a minute, does all kinds of bad things. He's very much the sort of Satan figure. And actually, I'll mention he was born, his sort of, well, one day he was celebrated was uh, June 24th, the sort of hottest day of the year. Just like uh, December 24th is when the sun gets, days start to get a bit longer. June the 24th is sort of the high height of summer. And when the summer starts, summer days start to get a bit shorter. I'll come back to the dates. Uh, next is Isis. She was um, queen uh, of Osiris and mother of Horus, very much a binding force, a, a gatherer, a collector, and um, if you like, the, 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 the powers of femininity in their positive aspect, like Osiris is the powers of masculinity in their positive aspect. Then we go last to Nephthys, who's Isis's sister and Set's wife. She represents the more destructive elements of femininity, just like Seth represents the more destructive elements of masculinity so you've got these sort of family of gods dad mum and son and then brother sister who are also uh, husband and wife now really partly what this is is a calendar really quickly uh, osiris and well osiris and horus are kind of associated with <coughs> december 24th uh, you know christmas time sorry Isis is often, well, usually associated with the spring equinox, Seth with the summer solstice, and Nephthys with the vernal equinox. So you've got a kind of a calendar, different 
aspects of the year and different aspects of the day because Isis was associated, associated with the rising sun uh, and Nephthys with the setting sun. Seth was associated with um, like midday, high sun, and Osiris with like midnight. So you've got these cycles going on. So having established that, I'll quickly tell you the story of Isis and Osiris and explain why there's barley on the, on the, um, in the image there. So Isis and Osiris were, you know, were living, uh, they were great kings and queens, everything was perfect until one day Seth, because he was jealous, tricked Osiris, killed him, and I'm telling you a short version, killed him and sort of scattered him into 72 pieces across Egypt. Isis noticed he didn't come home for tea that night and sort of was like, okay, I'll, I'll go look for him. And with her sister, Nephthys, she gathered together all these parts of Osiris again. I'm, I'm skipping to the end, if you like. So they put Osiris back together, uh, but unfortunately he's missing his penis. So Isis and Nephthys fashion a penis out of a golden piece of barley. That's the story. And I, I, Isis and Osiris, um, you know, enjoy, enjoy each other's company one last time. And nine months later, Horus is born. I want to point out that uh, sort of technically this would have been a virgin birth because that's one of the ways in which Horus' con conception was described. So anyway, with his mum's help uh, and eventually he defeats his un e evil uncle Set, who killed his dad. It was in that battle Horus lost his eye. The god Thoth puts the eye back together, sticks it in Osiris's face. Osiris beats Seth and good conquers evil. So you've got this sort of cyclic, cyclical story where uh, then Horus, because he's now Pharaoh, he kind of becomes Osiris. He gets older, he marries, he goes off to heaven, his son is born, and there's this kind of process. It's, it's a legendary kind of cycle. Now, it's all pretty mad and there's millions of details to it. it got told a million times but the thing that really kind of crystallized it for me was when Robert Graves pointed out that this was <coughs> really an agricultural myth what you're having described is the seasons with regard to barley and suddenly I was like ah suddenly this sort of makes some kind of sense it's not just completely random the Egyptians did a lot of drugs um you know it wasn't just that there was the symbolism to it and it's very beautiful and it's really in Egypt obviously being able to produce a an agricultural surplus was the difference between living and dying and it was also the basis of their entire civilization because you know they could make some barley put it aside and then do other things like build pyramids and so on so what you've got in the story of Isis Osiris is the kind of a, a ritual or set of religious rituals that celebrate prosperity fecundity, whatever you want to call it, the bounty, bounty, you know, the bounties of nature. This is great, this place, Egypt, because all we have to do is do, you know, four months work a year feeding ourselves, and we can spend eight months a year doing other stuff. This is brilliant. So in a lot of ways, Isis and Osiris sort of pertain, it pertains to that growth and prosperity. To take this back to um, London, I'm going to point out uh, some similarities between the churches, their locations, and the roles of the varying go various gods in that story. And you're going to have to bear with me a little bit. But first of all, the church label number two, St. Alphages in Greenwich. Greenwich is obviously famous for the Meridian Line, and that was set up following Sir Christopher Wren building the observatory there. That line was literally the line from which every calculation made by the navigators of the British Navy were made in relation to mid midday at that place, how high was the sun, what distance were they east and west, everything was measured from that line. It, be it became the ultimate kind of line in the sand, could have been anywhere, but that is nought degrees uh, well, latitude. Also there are, there are um, uh, measures to do with the length of the foot, the weight of the pound, it was where standard measurements and lengths were, were kept. It's kind of like a repository of these incredibly important units of measure. The spirit of Thoth, I would suggest, lives on in Greenwich, you could put it broadly. I should say also that <clears throat> historically, in, in Hawksmoor's time, Freemasons identified with the god Thoth because he was kind of the power behind the throne. He was the wise one who understood measurement and science. <clears throat> there was a sort of identification <clears throat> 
uh, between the free, the, the Freemasons identified themselves with the priesthood of Thoth. St Anne's Limehouse, labelled number three, is the tallest church, was the tallest, second tallest clock tower in the country, and the highest clock tower in a church anywhere uh, for a long time. It is, as you turn up the Thames, go north up the Thames, past the Isle of Dogs, it's right there in front of you. It welcomes you into London. It welcomes sailors, you know, seamen into London for centuries, and it was essentially there to act as a sentinel. When you get to Wapping, you're in the docks. And um, like I said, Osiris gets torn into 72 parts. Here at the, um, the docks, the ship would come in with its cargo and get ripped to shreds. Often the ship itself, if it was being decommissioned, would have itself ripped to shreds. And I want to sort of make that analogy with the, the ship being having itself sort of torn apart. The next one is number one, Christchurch Spitalfield. That's where the market was and where a lot of goods and, goods and services were bought and sold. The symbol of the cross, uh, not um, as a not as a, a Christian cross, but as an X. It was often associated, I'm going to say, with this kind of idea in that you had the heavens above and you had the earth below. And in the person of Horus or in the person of Christ is where the two points, the two sort of worlds met. So you've got this sort of borderland between uh, the docks in the east and the city and the west end to the west of Spitalfields. Now, Nephthys, the goddess of judgment and weighing. So if you go into the city of London, the from Mary's Woolnoff, Portsmouth Church there, which is actually explicitly based on the Temple of Solomon, was where wisdom lived. It's where people assessed the worth of uh, goods and services. And it was very often the difference, if you like, between living in capitalist heaven and capitalist hell. What the judgments made in the city of London would uh, define the fate of um, many ventures. And I'll just finish with Osiris and then show you what I mean. Osiris was the West End. Uh, the Bloomsbury was the first of the many fashionable squares that were built in London. It's where the wealth ended up. Bloomsbury was in incredibly cosmopolitan and affluent. It was the kind of, if you like, the cream on the cake of the whole city of London. It's where the posh people had their townhouses and lived the good life that being rich could afford you. So if you can imagine, you've got this broad process of a ship coming into London and its cargo and, and so on being going through various processes. It's, it's taken out, you know, the cargo is obviously dispersed. The value of it is then assessed in the city of London. And depending on, you know, that value, either wealth will be created or not. And that wealth will be shifted almost in, inevitably to where the wealthy people are already in the West End. And similarly, people in the West End could go, all right, I want to do something with my money. And the sort of process is reversed. They'd invest in the city. The city would invest in goods and ships and services. That would go to Wapping. Those would go out into the world. And that's your sort of cycle of trade. If you can imagine, obviously London was built because of, its, of the river. It was the, I'm going to say, the sort of, if you like, what we call today, the cycle of boom and bust. It was kind of understood how to create markets, how to create wealth. And my take on this, and I know it's a bit of a stretch of the imagination, is that it's something like that for Hawksmoor. You've got these churches laid out in specific locations across London. And um, as I say, the process of trade, if you like, the cycle of trade being represented in the locations and the, the, the types of uh, activity that happened in those areas. The... So ritualization of prosperity is where I what is what I think Baltimore was ultimately up to. Now, as I said, there were going to be 50 churches built under this act, and there ended up only being 12 because the Whigs put a stop to it. But each one of these churches was going to act as the local, uh, you know, police. The, lo the, the local police would be run there. The local, obviously, the um, religious services, but it was also the parish councils. You had prisons and law enforcement, taxes, all coming out of these churches. Now, if you'd built 50 churches across London, I think the aim was there to do in 50 churches what Christopher Wren had wanted to do in one big swoop with his roadmap. And that was to change the, the character of London, make it almost impossible 
for dissenting voices to exist because once one of those churches was in your area that they could fine you and imprison you for not turning up on Sunday. The, the local priest had incredibly pernicious sort of moral, uh, pernicious moral authority, which they'd throw around. And these Tory churches built like castles were not there for the benefit of the locals, for them to express their spiritual, spirituality. It was very much state propaganda. They were putting them there so these people learnt how to behave. One really interesting fact about Christchurch Spitalfields, and one of the things that really, yeah, like I just, I've, I've never been down there, but I'd love to go. Uh, there's a tunnel that runs from Christchurch Spitalfields to um, a building on Brick Lane. That's an escape tunnel, because the the the, the you know the the rector, the victor, the vic, vicar, the priest, whoever it was, was presumably going to be in a position of threat if they're just there um, lecturing the locals all the time and locals might not like it and they needed a way to get out so there's actually an escape tunnel built into the church and I wanted to get down that tunnel so much that it really this is what, part of what inspired me to look more because like I said in the novel Hawksmoor Peter Ackwood says he, Hawksmoor built a labyrinth down there and as a boy who played Dub Dungeons and Dragons that was just too much temptation so the, the, these churches were built as impositions uh, and literally some of them needed escape tunnels just in case the, the locals got restless. Nothing to do with people expressing themselves, everything to do with being lectured and bullied by the state. And when you look at the buildings, they're there to intimidate. They're there to uh, instill a solemn and awful, an awful kind of respect because they're just intimidating. To finish off, Hawksmoor was very much interested in uh, landscapes and town planning. He, he got involved in re drawing some of Oxford and some of Cambridge. He was a town planning expert. Now, his master, Christopher Wren, was as close to being on the inside of the Stuart Royal family as it's possible to be. Hawksmoor um, lived very much in Wren's shadow. Hawksmoor was a royalist, a Freemason and a Tory. He was a town planning expert. The sides of his square is a nearly exact, and you, that, that's a, you can't really argue with that. And even more, if he'd actually built the Wapping Church where he'd wanted to, that the size of that square would have been almost, within a couple of yards on each face, exactly the same. And that doesn't happen by accident, given that he actually built the bits of land. So he, what was he doing? He was doing something. I don't know exactly what he was doing, but you've seen my best guess and roughly what he was trying to do. There's still intrigue and mystery surrounding his name. And actually what I found once I sort of started delving into him and his life and the circles he was in. Actually, what he was doing is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the previous generation with Christopher Wren, a guy called Robert Murray, other people around the Stuart monarchy, they were up to, up to mischief, uh, all in the name of really reimposing Tory authority on the city of London and London, which had rebelled and executed, you know, Charles I, Charles, the, the current king's father. So you can understand why maybe there was a, a little bit of a grudge there. Hawksmoor, very much a secondary figure, uh, nowhere near as talented as Wren, very much lived in his shadow. And towards the end of his life, a lot of his ambitions were thwarted because of his Tory associations and the Whigs were in power. So he, 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 he died kind of frustrated and knowing that he'd failed to do what he'd been told to do, which is impose these 50 churches on London to try and impose Tory control over London in a way that Wren had failed to do the generation before. <laughs>